This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. A working rageaholic, out of rehab and in denial. I got a personal trainer, a personal shopper, a personal assistant, and a personal agenda. You can't shut me up, you can't dumb me down, because I'm tireless and I'm wireless. I'm an alpha male on beta blockers. I'm a non-believer, I'm an overachiever, laid back and fashion forward. Up front, down home, low rent, high maintenance. I'm supersized, long-lasting, high-definition, fast-acting, oven-ready, and built to last. A hands-on, foot-loose, knee-jerk head case, prematurely post-traumatic, and I have a love child who sends me hate mail. But I'm feeling, I'm caring, I'm healing, I'm sharing. A supportive, bonding, nurturing primary caregiver. My output is down, but my income is up. I take a short position on the long bond, and my revenue stream has its own cash flow. I read junk mail, I eat junk food, I buy junk bonds, I watch trash sports. I'm gender-specific, capital-intensive, user-friendly, and lactose-intolerant. I like rough sex. I like tough love. I use the F word in my email, and the software on my hard drive is hardcore, no soft porn. I bought a microwave at a mini mall. I bought a minivan at a megastore. I eat fast food in the slow lane. I'm toll-free, bite-sized, ready-to-wear, and I come in all sizes. A fully equipped, factory-authorized, hospital-tested, clinically proven, scientifically formulated medical miracle. I've been pre-washed, pre-cooked, pre-heated, pre-screened, pre-approved, pre-packaged, post-dated, freeze-dried, double-wrapped, and vacuum-packed, and... And I have an unlimited broadband capacity. I'm a rude dude, but I'm the real deal. Lean and mean, cocked, locked, and ready to rock. Rough, tough, and hard to bluff. I take it slow. I go with the flow. I ride with the tide. I got glide in my stride. Driving and moving, sailing and spinning, jiving and grooving, wailing and winning. I don't snooze, so I don't lose. I keep the pedal to the metal and the rubber on the road. I party hearty, and lunchtime is crunch time. I'm hanging in, there ain't no doubt, and I'm hanging tough over and out. Euphemisms. It's a whole new language. Euphemistic language turns up in many areas of American life in a variety of situations. Not all euphemisms are alike, but they have one thing in common. They obscure meaning rather than enhancing it. They shade the truth, but they exist for various reasons. Sometimes they simply replace a word that makes people uncomfortable. For instance, the terms white meat, dark meat, and drumstick came into use because in Victorian times, people didn't like to mention certain body parts. No one at the dinner table really wanted to hear Uncle Herbert say, Never mind the thighs, Margaret. Let me have one of those nice, juicy breasts. It would have made them uncomfortable. And at the same time, for the same reason, belly became stomach. But even stomach sounded too intimate, so they began saying tummy. It's actually a bit sad. I first became aware of euphemisms when I was nine years old. I was in the living room with my mother and my Aunt Lil when I mentioned that Lil had a mole on her face. My mother was quick to point out that Lil didn't have a mole. She had a beauty mark. That confused me, because looking at Lil, the beauty mark didn't seem to be working. And it confused me further because my Uncle John also had a brown thing on his face, and it was clearly not a beauty mark. And so on that day, I discovered that on some people, what appeared to be moles were actually beauty marks. And as it turned out, they were the same people whose laugh lines looked a lot like crow's feet. By the way, that whole beauty mark scam worked so well that some women routinely began using eyebrow pencils to apply fake beauty marks, a fake mole being something no self-respecting woman would ever think of giving herself. Somehow I can't imagine Elizabeth Taylor turning to Joan Crawford and saying, Lend me your eyebrow pencil, Joanie. I'm going to put a fake mole on my face. By the way, it was only a few years after the Aunt Lil incident that I took comfort in the fact that some people apparently thought my ugly pimples were nothing more than minor skin blemishes. Another role euphemisms play is to simply put a better face on things, to dress up existing phrases that sound too negative. Non-profit became not-for-profit, because non-profit sounded too much as though someone didn't know what they were doing. Not-for-profit makes it clear that there was never any intention of making a profit in the first place. But some words that are euphemized aren't even vaguely negative. They're just considered too ordinary. For that reason, many things that used to be free are now complimentary. Asking the hotel clerk if the newspapers are free makes you sound like a mooch. But are the newspapers complimentary? Allows you to retain some small bit of dignity. This is the reason some hotels offer their guests 
complimentary continental breakfasts, while others give their customers free donuts. If you're one who would enjoy a closer look at euphemisms, you'll find a number of sections in the book that will interest you. I broke the euphemisms into segments because they play such a large and varied role in American speech. And I call it the new language because it's certainly new to me. I know I didn't grow up with it. And that's my larger point, that it's gotten worse over time. There were probably a few early signs I noticed, but I knew the problem was getting serious when I began to hear ordinary people refer to ideas as concepts. And now, stiff up a lip, you know. Imagine two different commercial airliners taking long, fatal plunges directly into the ground from high altitudes. One is a British Airways plane filled with staid English diplomats and upper-class landed gentry. The other plane is Alitalia, filled with uneducated Sicilian, Greek, and Turkish peasants. As the two planes dive towards certain destruction, which one do you think will have the louder screaming and the more colorful praying, cursing, and blasphemy? You get one guess. Hint, it isn't the British plane. Are your eyes dry and itchy? It's possible you may have dry, itchy eyes. Don't take a chance. Call now for Eye Blaster, a special self-powered unit that blasts hot, refreshing steam directly into the eyes to relieve symptoms fast. Just plug in the Eye Blaster and wait 45 minutes for full heat and steam pressure to build up. Then blast the scalding hot steam directly into your eyes for 30 to 40 minutes. Submerge your head immediately in ice water for 15 minutes. Then repeat the steam treatment. Repeat these steps seven times and then take a breather. Do not use more than 15 times in one 24-hour period. Children under five should not use Eye Blaster unsupervised. When using on pets, tie pet to a chair before blasting. Safe for old people. Doctor approved. But not eye doctors. Call now. Boxing is an activity in which each of two men, by delivering a series of repeated sharp blows to the head, attempts to render the other senseless, leaving him lying on the floor unable to act rationally, defend himself, or even stand up. If one of the two men is knocked down and beaten into an only partially blank and helpless mental state, the other is made to stand aside and the contest is halted momentarily, while the damaged man regains just enough strength to stand up and have the beating continue to the point where he is again lying on the floor, this time completely immobile and functionless. Afterward, the two men embrace in a display of good sportsmanship. Hi, Billy. I'm, I'm Uncle John. I came up to say goodnight. You, you remember your Uncle John, don't you? You remember the time I took you down to the beach and we set the hot dog stand on fire and three people died? Wasn't that fun? Remember running away from the police and how we hid in the sewer? And Uncle John got poo-poo all over him, and he wiped it on your coat. You remember? Then I took you to the bar and got drunk and vomited on the jukebox. And sparks started flying out of the jukebox, and a fire started, and all the people were screaming. Remember that? Remember the screaming and the ambulances? Wasn't that fun? And do you remember that other time, the time I took you to the circus? The lion got loose and ate a monkey. Remember? Wasn't that fun? And then they had to kill the lion, and the monkeys got real sad, so they had to kill the monkeys, too. Wasn't that great? And then the man fell off the trapeze and smashed into the ground, and they had to kill him. And all the other trapeze people got real sad, and they had to kill them, too. Huh? Wasn't that fun? Why are you crying, Billy? Please don't cry. Please, if you stop crying, I'll take you to the rodeo. Wouldn't that be fun? Maybe someone will get trampled or gored. They got horses and cows, too, you know. Maybe they'll have to kill a horsey or a cow. <laughs> and if they kill a cow, maybe we'll get to eat him in a hamburger. Wouldn't that be fun? Please, please don't cry. Hey, you remember the time you fell out of my car? Huh? Remember you were looking out the window and we went around a corner real fast to keep from hitting that lady and you went flying out the window and hit the pole head first. And the doctor had to sew your head up with a big needle. <laughs> I got a boat now, Billy. You want to go out on my boat? I promise I'll be careful. Are you asleep yet? Billy, Billy, please stop crying. This is about redundancies, and it's called Count the Superfluous Redundant Pleonastic Tautologies. 
My fellow countrymen, I speak to you as co-equals, knowing you are deserving of the honest truth. And let me warn you in advance, my